and it looks like we are live, at least one of us. Um, I'm Alan Galbraith, <laughs> uh, the head gasket at the Concord de Limones, and with us, uh, joining us this morning, uh, apparently to him, is uh, Jason Camissa, Automotive Bon Vivant. Jason, how are you? First of all, I'm offended. Bon Vivant implies that I'm ever happy. Uh, I'm not. Okay. I hate you and you and you and you and everyone else. It's just, no, yeah. I don't ever have a good time. Um, well, that makes you title, happy, though. <laughs> does it? It, does, it makes me happy to be miserable. Okay. I see okay, your, you see your logic. You're one yeah. step ahead of me. Typically, I go by professional idiot or just moron or jerk or all the other things that people are screaming at me. But whatever you like to call me is fine. All right. Fish. Well, <clears throat> thank you for joining us today. Um, and whatever title you are using and... Uh, We've got some, this isn't the normal Thursday therapy. We're spinning this off uh, with Concord de Limon. So we can talk about uh, some non-lemony car stuff. We'll throw some lemony stuff in there too, but uh, just car stuff in general and, you know, kind of what's, what's happening in the car world today. And a big thing that came down just this last week was California is going to mandate electric cars, only electric car sales in the state of California by 2035, is it? And boy, that uh, that poked the hornet's nest on the internet of people, you know, oh my God, what are we going to do? It is fascism and I can't stand to not have my electric car or my car with a 455 in it getting five miles a gallon. Uh, you know, it's kind of coming whether we want it or not. Tough. Am I allowed to say things like titty? Like in, yeah, the, in the sense of tough titty? Yeah, okay, yeah. tough titty. It's happening. Here's the, here's the thing. We don't in, I, I know we as Americans feel like we live in a bubble that only includes America because frankly, you know, we have enough drama and craziness to be our own little world. For the, but for we the don't, entire world, the, yeah. Right, we're more than enough. <laughs> the reality is we live in a world where other countries have already made similar mandates. So whether we like it or not, the, the automotive industry is going electric. And I feel like this is our 1975 right. moment where, you know, and I wasn't born yet when the 1975 regs were, were passed. And that's a dig at how old you are. Um, because, but, but at the end of the day, we all thought, and the Malays era proved us right, that the, the automobile was going to be completely destroyed by emissions regulations. If you look at what has happened to air quality in cities like Los Angeles, for example, you realize that while it was painful to have 17 horsepower Corvettes, um, it was the right thing to do. And right now, it is the right thing to do. We have to move towards electrification because um, we just don't have a choice. The planet is very angry with us. Right now, yeah. I can't see my neighbor's house because it's so smoky outside. The world is literally, my world is on fire. Um, and that is, you know, climate change. We have to do whatever we can, whatever it takes right now. And if that means our toys, and I mean that term, have to suffer, then our toys have to suffer. By the way, well, here's the there's deal. a- funny, funny you, br you brought, huh? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, I just got a ride around Laguna Seca in a, in a, a 1,080 horsepower electric, electric lucid air. And let me tell you, our toys ain't gonna suffer. Like this is unbelievable. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to we'll get yes. to that in just a minute. <laughs> well, um, you know, funny you brought up Los Angeles. I I've been I lived in Los Angeles in the eighties. I've you know had family there from the sixties on. Um, you know, and I've seen the air quality from the sixties through the seventies. I want you to go back and watch an episode of Chips, and you're going to see that a lot of it is filmed outside, and you're going to see this beautiful soft light this gorgeous, you know, overcast that's there in Los Angeles all the time. And every 70s TV show and movie has that same look. And I'm here to tell you, that's not overcast. That's smog. That was there 24-7, 365. And it got this beautiful light. And you can see it in all the productions. The problem is that was there for decades. It never went away. When I lived in Los Angeles, Mount Baldy was about 30 miles across the valley from me. I saw it twice the whole time I lived there. And those were days after it rained. And that was because wow. of pollution. And now you go to Los Angeles and it's relatively clear, except for there's, you know, the, the number of smog alert days has come way down. There's a lot more people. 
there's a lot more cars, they're driving a lot more miles, but magically the air is better. And that's yeah. not a coincidence, right? And that's something we're gonna have to move towards. Yeah, and, and look, we've made a lot, of, a lot of progress even in the last 15, 20 years. So the, my, the story that I tell of Los Angeles, I, look, I have never lived in LA, but I've spent a lot of time there professionally because that's where so much of the car industry is. Um, a friend of mine bought a house, I think 17 or 18 years ago in Glendale, which is one of the suburbs just north of LA. Um, and he bought a house on a, on a street that's a really like next to a school. It's just like a little bucolic, like, you know, Wisteria Laney kind of street. And about a month later, he sent me this picture, which we had to go out with a, with a digital camera, take a picture and download it and email it to me. And it was of the end of his street. And the end of the street, right behind it, there's this incredible mountain right there. And he had lived, he bought the house, went through the whole process, never knew there was never a mountain knew. right at yeah. the end of the street. Yeah. Never saw it. And once a month, he, he would see it. If something would happen, the airs would, the, the winds would shift. And he would see this mountain and would always send me a picture like, this is unbelievable, look at this. 15 years later, he never not saw that mountain. Right. I mean, now it's once a year or twice a year where it's where it's smogged in. It's only two miles away from him with that mountain. But we've made a lot of progress in the Sulev and Yule, you know the, the the current emission standards, the ZEVs right. and PZEVs. So we have to continue that process <coughs> of of evolving. Sorry, I, Corona, obviously. Yeah. Sudden sudden onset <laughs> coronavirus. <coughs> um, because I just choked down granola cereal because you made me get up at 10 30 well, in the morning yeah you know, the crack at 10 uh, right yeah you know. yeah um no but the, the, you know we have to continue this process or it's just going to get worse uh in terms of climate change and flooding right. and storms and all the rest of the stuff and so it's got to be you know it's just got to be and i'm i'm sorry but uh california is going to lead the charge on this um in the u.s but the rest of the the rest of the world is already there germany is 2030 five oh. years before we are yeah, and, and Volkswagen is already switching over to all electric production, right? The world's largest car manufacturer. They're already doing it without a mandate, right? They're What's going to be available to be bought? Well, there's a well, little bit. I mean, there was a little bit of the diesel game thing. Well, there's that, you know, whoopsie. But, <laughs> but even before that, even before that, Volvo announced that its latest family of four-cylinder engines would be its last ever generation of right. internal combustion engines. Mercedes has said the same thing. Mind you, Volkswagen's EA113 four-cylinder went into production in 1974 and is still in production. I mean, in some smaller markets. So right. engines can have a really long timeline. However, right. we have, we're looking at the last generation of internal combustion engines, one way or another. And, you know, people are screaming about the timeline of, hey, that's only 15 years away. And, you know, here's, here's, a, <laughs> here's a nice picture. You think about what it took to go from horse-drawn to automobiles, to gas-powered automobiles. And you figure, you know, I, I read a, a statistic that said uh, automobiles outnumbered horses in New York City in 1908, right? Then you figure by the time the, the Model T really went into production, really started swinging until the time that horses were completely, you know, all but in really rare instances eliminated from even rural areas in California, you figure by the 30s, late mm -hmm. 30s, the horse was no longer, in, uh, you know, the main means of conveyance the automobile was and that's 15 20 years right you know all we're saying is and all the mandates are saying is hey in 15 years you don't even have to give up your your internal combustion engine you just they're only going to be electric cars available right? right so there's even a longer timeline for transition are the charging stations in place no they're not but they will be i mean if we can pull goo out of the ground on the other side of the world, get it on a boat, ship it here, build a facility that then refines it into gasoline, and then ship that gasoline to every corner quickie mart and every you can, place in the world. Then we can run an extension cord. Yeah, we can, <laughs> we can, fig, we can figure that part yeah. out, right? Yeah, we can make that happen. So I'm, there, I'm confident... Have, yeah. <laughs> Have you seen that meme about, uh, of, of, well, it, wasn't, it was sort of a meme. It was a compilation of two photos taken, I think, eight years apart in New York. 
And one of them was spot the spot the automobile, and one was spot the horse. Uh, um, and it was I, I I wish I had actually done some homework or cared about this podcast at all. Yeah, uh, you don't. Um, I don't. Or, care about it, <laughs> or yeah. I found it. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality was, <clears throat> you know, we're saying fifteen years is such is is quickly. You went from the streets of New York, dominated by horses, with an occasional car, to a decade later, completely the opposite. This is not a problem. And we're, we're not going to be rid of our. You know, you can you can apply all those same same arguments they used with the with the gasoline and the horses to now. Where are you going to find gas? Oh, you can't get it. Oh, you, it comes in these little glass bottles. What happens when there's no gas? You know, your car runs right. out of gas. Then what do you do? Well, that's what we're hearing now from you know people clinging to their 454 big blocks. You know, saying, well, "Look, I want them." Yeah, I want them to cling to their 454 big blocks, and they should. right? Yeah. What what I don't want is new commuter cars to be burning, burning gas. For as wonderful as a Prius is at sipping fuel mm-hmm. and get delivering really great gas mileage, it's still the wrong solution. It was a right. stepping stone. It was an interim solution, and we have found a better way. And the better way is torquey and electric and clean and all that other stuff. And keep your 454s. Keep your keep your you know pre small cars. Awesome. But the our speaking of a be better done. way, yeah. Okay. Speaking of a better way, four hundred miles of range, two point five seconds, zero to sixty. Okay, Think so that by second. the way, <laughs> I was in that car. I got a ride around yeah. Laguna Seca in that car. Um, it's not four hundred miles of range. It's five seventeen is the first EPA number, and they're petitioning the right. EPA for the for an adjustment to make it five fifty. Um, and the, the, so there will be two, that's, that is the Lucid is a new startup for, for anyone right. who hasn't heard yet. Lucid is a new startup. Uh, they're based in Silicon Valley. They're owned by, I believe, a Saudi investment group. Um, and this is a really interesting car for a number of reasons. Number one, it is Tesla Model S 2.0 because most of the team who are working on the car, including the chief technology officer um, and most of the engineers are from Tesla. Uh, and these are the guys who were the project managers for Model S. So it's really their second shot at making a Model S. But more importantly, and very cool, the company itself is Tesla 2.0 because wow. they're able to figure out all the things, all the resources that they didn't have and all the mistakes that they made and recreate all of the good things without the bad things of starting Tesla. Um, and so they're not limited and they're also kind of not it limited by Elon and his craziness. So, uh, you know, Elon's amazing, but he's also, you know, he's as much of a liability as, as, as he has a benefit. Um, so they're able to really start over and make this new car. It is about the size of the Model S, but it's far larger in size. It's far more luxurious. Um, and, you know, the, the Model S when it started was 5.4 seconds to 60 or something, which was mind-blowingly fast for an electric vehicle because it's instant. This thing is, the most insane thing I've ever been around a racetrack in. Um, whatever it, okay, and so that's the concept. In that, yeah. <laughs> well, that's not exactly the way the production car looks, but the, I mean, the, take that idea and make it a right. production car idea. It is absolutely stunning inside out, um, inside and out, I should say. Um, and the 1080 horsepower car that did nine, nine, nine at 140 miles an hour on the quarter mile with less than two and a half seconds blah, 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 is the slow one. Right. The fast one did its first run out at 9.25 at 158 miles an hour on the quarter mile. Um, and that's the triple motor one that just set a 131 lap time at um, Laguna Seca. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Laguna Seca, yeah. <clears throat> one minute 31, which which is is still, it's still a mule. I mean, it has the factory, like, non-crazy brake pads on it and just... They are, these cars are so unbelievably fast and capable. And when you can have torque vectoring and you, they're what, they're really heavy, but if you have a low center of gravity, all these tricks you can do, we're ushering in a new era of performance. And while we'll always pine after our old cars for the sound and the experience, uh, they have no chance, no chance of keeping up with new electric stuff. What's the feel of something like this versus say going around the track in a in an amg mercedes uh uh, sedan it's three orders of magnitude faster so 
the I, look, I didn't drive the air, but I was in the in the passenger seat. We had we had an off. I mean, you know, it was the full dynamic experience, including a crash, basically. Right. Not we didn't hit anything, but we're not. <clears throat> so the, the wild thing is this this lucid air is not a performance car. This is not a sports sedan. It is one hundred percent a luxury sedan that just right. happens to have eleven hundred horsepower, basically. Um so the tires are not particularly aggressive and they're skinny. They're like two fifty-fives and two eighty-fives or something. They're they're not big. Right. But so in the corners, the car takes a nice flat set. It's fairly neutral. All of the guys on the chassis development team have to own rear wheel drive vintage BMWs, by the way. And that the <laughs> E39 M5 is their performance and handling, their ride handling benchmark. Like I think that's a yeah. right. I think that's a yeah. really great thing to do. So the car, it's not there yet. I mean, they're so they're working on it, right? These are early yeah. mills. Turns in, it's flat, it does everything really well. And you're like, okay, you're kind of leaning over, you're like, okay, this is this is a lot of grip. And then the driver gets on the gas. Because if it generates this much grip in the corner, it generates that much acceleration on the on the way out. So the traction circle is not a circle. It's the circle with like a penis on the bottom hanging out of it. Because oh my God, is it fast? Like it's gotta be pulling a G and a half in a straight line or 1.3 G's back like this. So it is the wildest experience in the world. And again, so the next this is comes the up slow really, one. Really, really fast. Uh, <laughs> and, and forget, forget about it. Laguna turn one is not really a turn in most cars. It's a, right. it's a kink in the middle of the front straight. It is a very much braking zone turn in this thing. Like, oh my God. Yeah, wow. absolute. Wow. It, a Veyron would have no chance in a drag race with this car. No chance, especially so, in the real so, world. Picture, picture that they've come out with a sedan, which are, you know, arguably not the most popular thing in the market right now. But, you know, this is going to be a luxury sedan, go up, go up against the S-Class and all that kind of stuff. They take that platform, they take that technology, wrap it in a two-seat sports car, get rid of some of the luxury, get rid of some of the weight, and invest a lot in handling and electronic handling. What do they have? They have, I mean, well, they have a Tesla Roadster. That's exactly what Tesla's doing, right? I mean, it's no surprise that that Lucid is doing exactly what Tesla did, right? First is the sedan, and then is the SUV that's coming right next. Uh, right. First is the dual motor car, then it becomes a tri-motor car, so they can have torque vectoring at the rear axle. I mean, these are the same guys with the same thought process, and they're all incredibly intelligent and making the right choices. But what we have is a new era of performance where you cannot be in the passenger seat without yarfing up everything you've eaten for the last six days. <laughs> I mean, and by the way, the thing about Lucid is it's not just, again, it's not a one-trick pony. This is a fully developed, uh, this is a car that's developed fully for level five autonomy, which means full actual self-driving. Every, right. every single com component in the car that or that electronic component is triple redundant. Like this is built like an airplane so that, you know, no matter what happens, the car can safely pull itself off the road or just continue to drive. You can cut all of the cables in two different places to the car and it'll still be able to drive. Um, Which I think is so they're trying to feed it, right? I mean, to, to yeah. reassure the public and reassure the government that we can have these things out on the road on their own without yeah. human intervention, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we're going to need, I mean, we definitely need that because we've all broken down in BMWs. So, you know, you can't, you can't be having weird errors. You can't, everything has to be perfectly stable, but that we're still away from level five autonomy, meaning right. full actual self-driving. Um, but it's nice to know that these cars are being designed from the outset with that in mind. Um, so hopefully all the silly little glitches that you get, for example, in Teslas um, won't happen. Just right. won't happen because the electrical infrastructure is there to be primarily stable. Um, and look, the first thing is we're going to get rid of internal combustion engines. Second thing is we're going to gradually give up our right to drive the cars. It's you know, gonna it's, it's going to be, and this is a, you know, 30, 50, 60 year discussion. Eventually someone's going to realize the fault in most car accidents is you and me, right? The fault isn't the car. So we can, you. we can eliminate the, oh, I never have an accident. No, never. Um, but if you can eliminate that, if you can eliminate that fault point, then numbers are going to go down. Crashes are going to go down. Safety is going to go up. You know, crashes per miles driven is going to, you know, go through the floor. Way down. And eventually it's going to be an economic driven thing to where you find out the insurance companies are going to mandate it. The, 
you know, the, the medical industry. And then we're going to figure out, well, geez, you know, we were slaughtering people on the roads because we drive like assholes, right? <laughs> and <laughs> cars don't, you know, the, the right. self-driving cars don't. And, you know. And there, and there could be some really cool benefits to this. Imagine, for example, so I-5 is the most miserable road in the world. It's the, the interstate that connects San Francisco and Los Angeles. Yeah. And it's 300 and something miles of absolute fucking boredom. Sorry. Nothing. Complete yeah. fucking boredom. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I envision a lane where the autonomous cars can have no speed limit, for example, you know, or limited to 120 miles an hour, for example. And right. the human driven cars are 50 you know, or 60 or 70, 70 as it is now, whatever it is. Right. There becomes a time where for the greater good of society, we just have to make some sacrifices. And we're not really great at doing that. So I think there will wind up being incentives like that, like, hey, your self-driving car can get you from L.A. to San Francisco in two and a half hours. But if you drive yourself, it's going to be five. Um, yeah. Well, and, you know, th there's going to come that point where, you know, I haven't had much experience with the with the self, uh, with the autonomous cars, but they're going to become so good where they are fully, you know, level five self self autonomous. You're still going to have to pay attention a little bit. But hey, watch a movie, listen to music, talk to somebody else in the car, relax. Right. And here's the thing you do more. Right. You do have a lot of experience with level five autonomous cars. They're called Ubers. Yeah. Right. There's that. So yeah. that, that the figure, it's exactly the same thing, except instead of some maniacal lunatic at the wheel who wants you dead and who's drinking at every stoplight that actually did happen to me. I had a woman take a swig of vodka at a stoplight in an Uber. The only difference is, is the computer going to be doing it? And if we can, we can prove without a doubt that you are far safer in a level five autonomous vehicle than you are in a human driven Uber. Uh, we now have gained a benefit that none of us have, which is we have a chauffeur. Right. And that's, that's our true luxury. Speak for yourself. Remember, I'm the one with the Rolls Royce, right? <laughs> Only because you can't sell it from what I heard. <sighs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, look, I have, I have seven cars, six of which are gas burning. I have one electric car. It's just sort of once you go electric, you can't go back. Um, so I have an e-golf that, that I drive sort of around town and I just lay tire right out of my house because you don't have to warm them up <laughs> um but i have six manual transmission high revving old cars that are that i own for the experience i don't own them for transportation i don't use them for transportation um and i want my toys i love my toys i will be very upset to have to gradually give up my ability to drive those toys well um, i don't but know I that you're going to i think there's going to be times and places to drive those cars right i agree um and it may not be, you know, no one commutes in their, well, some people commute in their rat rods with no roof and no floorboards, you know, on a daily basis for 70 miles through Los Angeles. There's one or two people out there that do that. But, you know, that's that's not the majority of folks. Even if you look at the way new cars are going, they're getting more and more technology. It's not about it, it's more about what the car does to for the person inside than the way it looks outside right. or the performance it has that is selling cars. And this is the next logical step in that to where it's the total experience where you just ride along you know, right. and you're entertained. Right, and uh, let's hope that there are, look, I live right near San Francisco. I drive into the city all the time. I expect that in the next 15 years, I will start to see restrictions on what I can drive in and out, right? Uh, European right. cities have this already. They have environment zones where you can't drive unless it's a zero emissions vehicle or, you know, the concentric circles outside of the city center is EV only. And then it's Euro six emission standards followed by Euro five and four or whatever. We'll, we'll well, probably just, have that's, to... just fascism. that's just fascism. Well, it's also a necessity. So you can call it whatever you want. But, you know, when when if you've been to Paris on a muggy, nasty day where you can't breathe and everything's kind of gross, you realize like, OK, I love my diesels, too. But come on. So, you know, I, I expect that there will be limitations. Um, what I do expect is that there will be a recognition of the importance of historical vehicles. Um, right. And I, it's my hope that those cars will be exempted um, and they'll be allowed to be driven occasionally, which is all I want. I, I drive my cars, you know, occasionally, yeah. not for transportation, but if I need to go to dinner with friends and it's, you know, commuting into the city, I get into my autonomous pod and I'm brought there while I'm, by the way, reading my emails and, you know, looking at porn and uh, oh, that was a slip, not porn, um, oh. the news, Re 
Read the news. Yes. Yes, indeed. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you, you guys, but get what you mean. I mean, if you don't have to, if you're not driving, what do we do in the back of Ubers? We sleep, you know, we do, we do Check what feet. we want to do. Yeah. I can't so, hear you, by the way. No, no, you cannot hear no, me. It's my problem or yours. I think it's your problem. I think oh. everyone can still hear me. Can anyone hear me? Anyone yes. in the comments? I, yes. I Yep. Okay. But <laughs> I can't can hear you. you. Okay. Well, here, um, let's do this. Um, we are going to uh, work out this issue while we watch this. Uh, speaking of electric vehicles and fun stuff you can do with them, um, there's a <clears throat> new um, uh, series out on Apple uh, TV Plus called The Long Way Up. And for those of you that are not uh, familiar with it, it is Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman in their third installment of a... Uh, of a series they did the long way round where they uh, rode motorcycles around the world they did the long way down and went to the southern tip of africa and now they're doing the long way up from the southern tip of south america to los angeles on electric motorcycles so let's uh let's check this out here i've been dreaming of doing a trip through south america for years we're here with Mel famous actor and mcgregor but life got in the way and now I've decided to do the trip with my best friend, Charlie Broman. You've got to look after the relationships in your life. And if you don't, you're just, you're losing something that's very important. We'll ride 13,000 miles from the southern tip of Argentina all the way to Los Angeles. 150 miles every day is a long way to go. And if that wasn't enough of a challenge, we wanted to see if we could do it on electric motorcycles. <laughs> I think it's the future electric. You'd be the first people to go this distance, charging as you go. Oh my God, it's so great, isn't it? Oh, uh oh, mm, the power's just gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is us on the road, Charlie. This is us on the way, man. I'm gonna get attacked by this dog. <laughs> <laughs> We're right through the brutal Patagonian winter. Look at that snow. It's amazing how cold it is. We're going to climb to the extreme heights of the Andes and experience the real risks of high altitude. Ooh, I can't breathe. I'm definitely getting sick, Charlie. Before witnessing the endangered jungles of Central America. To think about all of the things that might go wrong. I think we're lost. Is this a road? Oh, it might be a little... <laughs> wow, wow, I'm falling off. In the middle of the night, things just go around your brain, don't they? I have real fear. I don't want anyone to get hurt. They just roll around. I'm not going to make it. Towing somebody on a bike is dangerous. What if the bikes don't work? What if we can't charge the bikes? What if it snows tomorrow? I really enjoy the unknown of it all. Just coming across the people we come across. Honestly, yes. Amazing, the people. Learning about the cultures and seeing how people keep their traditions alive puts you in touch with yourself and the world in a way. I'm an actor. What films have you made? Did anybody see Star Wars? No. I don't think so. None of these kids have seen anything I've done. <laughs> <laughs> Long way up, two guys lost in South America. So I uh, don't know if, uh, if you, can you hear me again? No, no. Okay. Well, now you can what. you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. I can hear you. <laughs> well, tell you what, we're going to say bye to uh, Jason. Okay. Bye everyone. Sorry. Technical difficulties. No worries. <laughs> so Jason's out for, for a little while, um, but we, we can still talk about this, uh, this series. Um, and they had some challenges doing this. It's really interesting to watch. They thought this through driving electric motorcycles, uh, the Harley Davidson live wire all the way from the southern tip of South America up to Los Angeles, and they needed some support vehicles. Um, so they went to Rivian um, and got two of the electric brand new, per, brand new production, uh, matter of fact, serial number one, um, electric pickups to run as support vehicles because they wanted to run as much electric uh, vehicles on this trip as possible um, to run along with them. There are some challenges with um, charging along the way. 
and Rivian went in and installed 150 charging stations the length of South America to make this possible. Um, and here's a little bit from, uh, from Rivian to show what they did. We don't need no stinking phone calls. We got work to do. We got an email. We want two electric vehicles to film this amazing series long way up. We want you to be a part of it. What are we up to? Uh, 6,600, there we go. So yeah, and we've got about that to go again. Uh, it's gonna be still quite the adventure. I can't really predict exactly what we're gonna face because that is the great unknown. This incredible journey from South America up to LA. I am so excited that they have license plate and they are on public roads. It's win number one, the first car, which is truly registered for Rivian. We built this vehicle to get some early durability testing. It looks and feels somewhat like production, but is very early and somewhat prototyping. When you give it full throttle, it is like four seconds to 80. In the production vehicle, we'll have more power and more torque to go even faster. 100 days of driving, 13 countries, 13,000 miles, wide open spaces. There are a bunch of wild horses. We just pulled up next to them, and it's a completely silent vehicle just sitting there idling. But there's no idle because you're an electric vehicle. One of the biggest challenges is charging. We built out a charging network throughout this route of South and Central America so you can do this. We're really happy to be showing people that you can have an adventure in some of the most remote places imaginable. Wow, this place is amazing. The testing is going really well. We're getting lots of data to understand what's happening, specifically with the battery, suspension, and chassis components. How can we get the car to act and react better. We've taken all of that data, we put it into the vehicles that we're going to have out to customers next year. I mean, we're all familiar with a lot of electric vehicles on the road today, but there is nothing sort of doing what this vehicle is embarking on right now. We've got sand, we've got rock, these washboard roads, constant go, 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 for, you know, 90 plus miles. There's all going to create a better product at the end of the day because this is a pretty epic adventure and if they can get through this, I think they'll get through pretty much anything. <laughs> I don't know, the fact that we're out here getting to do this and show the vehicles are capable, um, it's a pretty sweet day at the office. Thank you for being out here. For us. <laughs> Thanks for having us, man. So pretty cool. Uh, definitely worth checking out the series. Um, there's definitely there's some challenges, uh, but uh, that's what this is all about: is figuring out uh, how to overcome those. Um, we lost Jason. Uh, Jason, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties. Um, if you like this, uh, we're just dumb enough to keep doing it. Um, so let us know in the comments um, and uh, we will uh, keep doing it. Uh, it's not always going to be about electric cars. It's going to be about uh, lemon stuff. Matter of fact, there's a, a little bit of lemons news in that uh, we are um, going to be doing the fall failage tour coming up October 15th through the 17th in the Northeast. Uh, we're gonna see some good fall colors. We're gonna see some really awful cars. You can still sign up for that. I will be leading the tour. Um, we're gonna hit all the high points um, in the Northeast and some fun stuff along the way. And then we're gonna end up at a 24 hours of lemons race where hopefully we can get your uh, totally hoopty rally cars out on track for a couple of, uh, couple of laps around the track. Um, and it's a, just a good clean, fun time the the best and it's covid safe um you stay in your cars uh, at night if you want to chat up with the with the other uh participants just wear a mask and sit on the hood of your car and you can exchange stories of the day that way um 
a lot of fun. The key to hold that whole thing is the most inappropriate car for the task. You get points. You can end up winning something totally useless at the end of it. We make these little trophies, um, and you get the adulation of all the other folks uh, on the rally. Lots of fun. Uh, check out the uh, 24 Hours of Lemons website uh, to sign up for that and for details on that. And uh, since we have lost our guest and we're up against a time uh, time limit, we're going to sign off for now. Um, we'll leave you with uh, a little bit of footage from a previous uh, Concord de Limones event, um, which we have scheduled the first one for 2021. Fingers crossed that it can happen. Um, it is the Amelia Island event. Um, you can check the uh, 24 Hours of Lemons and Concord de Limones webpage uh, for dates on that. Um, but we are planning on it um, and we're going to be there, uh, hopefully, that uh, we can hold that event. In the meantime, uh, check this video out from, uh, from shows past and we will uh, see you next time. Deborah McDonald from Livonia, Michigan. This is my 1979 Pinto Squire Wagon. Uh, the color is tangerine and the interior is tangerine alpine plaid. When you come to a DeLemons event, everything's different. There's lots of pretty colors, different patterns. We have a lot of fun. We go to a lot of car events. This is our favorite. My name is Mark Vinson. I'm from Byron, Michigan. It's about 60 miles from here. And uh, this is a 1958 as a one year only for the Teletouch transmission and the large 410 cubic inch engine. I have to bribe the judge. And I thought about it all year long. And uh, I thought maybe this might do it. How is it? Oh, oh, brownie, fan brownie. <laughs>My name is Colin Brown, I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I am in a lovely 1981 DeLorean DMC-12. My favorite thing about this car, uh, every time that I get in it and I turn the key, I, I'm seven years old again. Uh, of course, I was a big fan of Back to the Future, and uh, every time that I get in it, it just reminds me of that, and I just love it. They're not as unreliable as people would think. It's not on fire, so that's a good day.